Good evening, everybody. Welcome to members of the National Liberal Club and their guests to this Zoom event. One of a series arranged by the Commonwealth Forum of the Club during this COVID-19 episode. I'm Lord Chigi, a Liberal Democrat peer and chair in the House of Lords of the All Party Groups for the Commonwealth and for Africa, formerly chair of the Lib Dem Parliamentary Committee for Foreign Affairs and Development in the Lords during the uh, co coalition government. As president of the forum, I shall be your host for the evening together with some co-hosts uh, uh, on the event, China and the challenges to liberal democracy. The format will be a 30 minute presentation illustrated by PowerPoint by my co-host Humphrey Hawksley and a brief discussion of the key issues with myself. It'll be followed by a Q&A session from you, our Zoom audience, held in our Zoom waiting room, managed by Tim McNally, the National Liberal Club Vice Chair. I'm now delighted uh, to welcome Humphrey Hawksley, a veteran BBC correspondent and author of numerous books on global politics and democracy. He's written for The Guardian, The Times, The New York Times, and other publications. His recent book, The Revised and Expanded Asian Waters, was described by Lord Patton of Barnes, formerly Conservative MP for Bath, last Governor of Hong Kong and Chancellor of Oxford University, as a very well-informed guide to an area of real tension in the early decades of the 21st century. Humphrey, over to you. Unmute. Unmute. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Lord Chiji, um, for introducing me there. I'm now going to attempt a technological feat and put the PowerPoint up uh, and talk to you about China and the challenge to liberal democracy. So if you bear with me for just a second, we'll see if this is going to work. And is that working? Can everybody see that? I'm coming off. No, we can't. We can't see it, Humphrey. You can't see it. It worked in the practice. Just bear with me for a second then. Are you seeing anything at all on the screen? So, sorry. No, no, Humphrey, I'm afraid we're not. Okay, let's, um, let's make this work. Um, if not, I'll have to do it without the PowerPoint, but that would be a shame. Let me um, try again. Ah. Uh, right. Ah, coming, 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 coming. We get, we, yes, we're getting there. We're getting there, Humphrey. Coming. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry about pressing the wrong button there. It's and okay. Thank you for your patience. So off, thank off you go. For being here. Um, Yes, uh, uh, Trevor Peel and I, who, who were arranging it, we discussed the title of this a little bit, and it was going to be China, the rise of Asia, uh, and, and all that sort of thing. But then it, it, the story kind of changed. Um, and we know now, even with the, the debate that's going on in Parliament today, that liberal democracy itself is questioning what it is and what it's doing. China is there, and when I say the challenge to liberal democracy, I'm not particularly meaning the threat um, and the guns and, and all of the, the authoritarian stuff and all that thing. I mean, how much is it making us look into what we are and how we have performed over the past 30 or 50 years? And my thinking came about the three versions of, of the book that, uh, that David kindly mentioned there, about four years ago, um, I was commissioned to do a book about the struggle over the South China Sea uh, and China's expansion, which basically went around the islands that, or territory that China was claiming in the South China Sea and international shipping lanes. And see American cover on the left. It's sort of pastel. It's not, uh, it, it, it's nuanced. Uh, the British cover, same words in the book, uh, that went for the more warlike thing. You can see fighter planes, warships, that sort of cartoon caricature of what might be happening. And then in June came out the uh, expanded and, and updated uh, edition of it where the story had completely changed. And there you've got a real life American warship going for an exercise 
in the South China Sea. The change was this, in a nutshell, is that back then when the book was commissioned, there was still a narrative coming from the West that China would join what we call the, the world order, uh, the international rules-based world order. It could be persuaded to become a partner in it. The narrative coming out now is that China will not be doing that. Uh, therefore, there is a contest between its autocracy and the liberal democracies of the West. And we've been there before. There's talk about the new Cold War and the rest of it. The story that this is becoming, I've been reporting on for more than 30 years in Asia. I've been uh, in Delhi and Beijing and Hong Kong and the Philippines. And the, the debate really is, is in a nutshell, it's in the West, we believe in individual freedom. In Southeast and East Asia, South Asia is a little different. The emphasis is on the right of the community over the individual. And that's it in a nutshell. And this was one story that we were going on um, with the BBC to Dongshar Island, one of the disputed islands. Uh, this one's between, disputed between Taiwan and uh, China. Uh, and when I was there, uh, we were doing a breakfast show, a two-way, they call it. This is the runway in Dongsha. Basically, it's just a runway and nothing else, a military runway. Uh, and something had happened that day in Iraq. There'd been a flare-up, a car bomb or something. And they went straight from Iraq to us, talking about the tension in Asia and the South China Sea. And I said, I began the piece, I said, we have to remember this is not the Middle East. This is a completely different issue and it's, in a way it's far more serious because it's not uh, non-state terror groups doing dreadful things. This is state power to state power and it gets quite complicated. So what are we talking about when we talk about the US-led world order? <laughs> We're talking about a system that much of, many of us take for granted that was born out of the Second World War and the catastrophe of the Second World War. And they, these are the institutions that have become familiar with that. Uh, International Monetary Fund, NATO, uh, United Nations itself, which in a way is that crucible of the, uh, of the international world order, the European Union, which is a sort of regional construct within the value system of that world order. Now, China, is creating its own, it's begun to create its own, and it's embryonic, it's tiny. There's no way it can replace, take on, or do anything that the current world order is doing. But it's still setting it up. And it's not building it out of the, the, the catastrophe of war, like, uh, like the current one is, it's building it with its sort of futuristic skyscrapers, roads, ports, uh, the sort of vision of wealth, and, and that sort of thing that the, the Chinese dream uh, under the leader uh, Xi Jinping at the moment. But this, this whole process has been going on, as I'll say in a second, for a very, very long time. And these are the symbols of that world order, uh, which we may or may not become familiar with, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, all of the, these things don't hit our headlines as NATO and the European Union do, but they're beginning to, to get some sort of traction uh, in that part of the world. Now, I had a problem, and the reason that this is very up and much to my mind is that the other day I was in my local bookshop, and I've known the owner there for many, many years. He said, Humphrey, what book should I tell everybody to read about this monster Xi Jinping. And I thought, oh, uh, I said, well, you can sell the mine, of course, but I sort of listed a, a number of authors on China. There are plenty of them. And then a customer came in overhearing us talking about China and Xi Jinping and said, yes, he really is a dreadful man, isn't he? We have to do something about it. What can we do? And then alarm bells went off in both antenna at that time, because this is the rhetoric that we had heard, many of us had heard, during the whole of the Middle East stuff. Saddam Hussein, what a monster, we must do something. Gaddafi, we must do something. Assad, we must do something. By the time we got to Assad, we didn't quite know what to do. 
But this idea that liberal democracy can do something about people that we don't like, or I should say we don't quite understand, uh, is a bit of a myth. And if you get that situation suddenly happening on a China crisis, where the conversation on the streets, that was the first time I'd sort of heard it at that level about China and Xi Jinping being a household name monster. Uh, when you get that happening with a the crisis, then that doorstep thought goes to the MP, goes to parliament, and you can get a prairie fire starting that's very difficult to stop. And we've been there before. Uh, many of us are of the generation that can remember uh, the Iraq war and the Arab uprisings, where there was a concept that went through the Liberal Democrat parliaments and the Congresses that we could topple a dictator, a regime we didn't like, and we could put in a panoply of things that would create uh, a democratic state. And we now know that it didn't quite work like that. And there was a reason that it didn't work, but we haven't quite explored and examined that. And the result from that was essentially war, dictatorship, and terrorism are much worse than it was uh, before. So in the eyes of tens of millions around the world, liberal democracy, as they might have thought it was, say, when the Berlin Wall came down, something that delivered more freedom, something that delivered a higher standard of living, something that delivered security, had lost that shine that it had at the time. Now, China, on the other hand, has basically always done what it said it would do on the tin. You might not like it, but there hasn't been a change of China's policy since the Communist Party took over in 1949. Uh, this is the famous picture from the Tiananmen Square protests, uh, which were ruthlessly put down uh, because the protesters wanted more freedom. China didn't want to give them that, and they crushed that rebellion and then rounded up uh, people and imprisoned them and the rest of it. China was then declared a complete pariah to the world. Nobody wanted anything to do with it. I remember a, 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 a junior foreign minister coming to Beijing saying he wasn't going to shake hands with the monsters that had blood on their hands up there uh, in, in the early 1990s. So China hunkered down, changed its sort of thinking a bit and became very rich and wealthy. 2001, it joined a bit of the world order in joining the uh, World Trade Organization and continue to get even richer. And then 20 years later, uh, the second pillar, a second pillar of liberal democracy uh, showed its flaws as well with the economic collapse, the corruption, the whatever's, nobody quite understood it. But that brought to us austerity, which I'm sure much this audience knows a heap of what it was about here, so I won't go into that, but it made us short of money. And then the same government that crushed those democracy protests, the same one party state, the same pariah, the same communist rule, we invited them in to uh, invest in our country. Buy HS, go build HS2, said George Osborne, come into our nuclear industry at Hinkley Point and Sizewall, build our 5G communications network, 50 billion pounds of investment over 10 years coming in, and a lavish state visit for Xi Jinping, drinking beer with uh, the Prime Minister, then Prime Minister David Cameron. At exactly that time, China was formulating the very policies that we're seeing now and coming up. And this is a, a quote from a speech he made in January 2013, after he had just come to power, uh, actually saying they must concentrate, China must concentrate its efforts on building socialism, a system superior to capitalism, laying the foundation for a future where China will win the initiative and have the dominant position. This is not a country wanting to join a world order, it's a country wanting to dominate a world order. Um, our intelligence services knew this, but the politicians weren't listening because they needed or wanted uh, Chinese money. 
all of that time, China was preparing, planning, laying the groundwork for those issues which are flooding into our front pages now. Uh, the, the Hong Kong uh, demonstrations and the security law that came in and a myriad of other ones. Uh, the India border conflict, which has been hitting the headlines lately, uh, sponsoring anti-Japanese protests in China. If you have a protest in China, the Communist Party has to um, has to sort of authorize it to happen. At the South China Sea uh, military bases, which I will uh, talk about again in a few minutes. And I think most crucially, when it comes to values, at the Xinjiang camps where a million odd uh, Uyghur Muslims are being imprisoned and re-educated against their will uh, by the Chinese government, uh, ostensibly in order to stop terrorism. Uh, and that's something I think that, uh, that we haven't really grasped on how to deal with any, any of these things at all. But we've known for a long time that they've all been around. The question is that China causing this tension. It can't take over the world order. It can't compete militarily. It can't compete economically. Why is it risking everything it has gained in order to uh, sort of cause this pushback that's coming against it. I was working out how to explain it best, and it was at the time that we had that row over the proms, um, which I'm sure most of us remember, and whether we should sing the lyrics of Rule Britannia or uh, during the last night. Uh, and those lyrics include, Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. And for some reason, is that it hits somewhere here. It's a patriotic feeling that uh, it divided people a bit, but you know, it's something, you know, yes, yes, we must have this and we must think this. Well, across in China, the narrative is that patriotic feeling is that for a hundred years or 110 years, China had its century of humiliation and the Chinese were slaves and never should it happen again. 1839, when the uh, British uh, breached the southern coastline in order to sell opium from the East India Company uh, to the Chinese uh, population, to 1949, when the currently ruling Communist Party took over. 110 years, the century of humiliation. And this is how it's told to the Chinese students and people, a picture from one of the museums, is that the disciplined uh, British troops with good technology, good science, good education, uh, went in and smashed down the corrupt, feudalistic, indisciplined uh, Chinese government, breached those coastlines. And this is where the British actually came ashore, a place called Human uh, on the southern Chinese coast. That cannon failed to stop the British guns, but more importantly, to the left there, you see these, this is a busload of students being there. Every day, the buses come in delivering people to hear this story. Now, when I've talked about the opium wars in other places, people object and say, well, this didn't happen, that didn't happen, you're balancing it wrong and all the rest of it, which might be true. But the fact is, is that the whole of the Chinese population, whether you're a school kid, a university student, a factory worker, a party official or whatever, has had this drilled into them ever since they uh, could speak and read and write. Uh, it is the same mythology that we had, many of us, when we were young, of that pink uh, map on the wall of our schoolrooms uh, saying how benevolent and civilizing uh, the British Empire was. So to not have it happen again, Xi Jinping and his predecessors uh, built the Great Wall of the Sea so that the southern coastline wasn't breached and they've claimed, this is the South China Sea, they've claimed uh, this international shipping lane as Chinese sovereign territory. Um, now you can see in this there's Paracel Islands uh, up on the uh, top left hand corner it's got a huge uh, military base, old Japanese base, which has been modernized. Down in the Spratly Islands here, there's five or six islands which have been reclaimed, uh, built up, and now constitute 
uh, military bases with planes and missiles and radar and all the rest of it on it. And the, the ships, as you see, they come through here uh, between the parasols and spread, it's like going through a strait and they go on up to China and Japan itself and Korea. Um, and because of the weaponry now that the Chinese have got, they essentially have military control of those international shipping lanes. There is no motive for them to do anything about it because they need to, to trade and, and take in the, 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 the oil and, and, and goods as much as anywhere else. But still, that, that, is, that is the fact there. Now, again, this is a new. This is a picture from 1995 that I put onto a BBC News report when I was in Beijing. Uh, this is a place called Mischief Reef. These are fishing shelters uh, and China just built them up, claimed the land. You can see that Chinese flag on the top of it um, and nobody did much. Other stuff was going on and, uh, and, and that claim stayed. Not, they didn't do much else. This is Mischief Reef in uh, 2012 uh, when Xi Jinping came to power. This is Mischief Reef in 2017, uh, which is basically a fully fledged military base, runway, radars, mobile missile shelters, and the rest of it uh, there. You've got five, I think five or six of those uh, in, in the area has, has happened there. And so China now is spreading its influence, having secured that coastline. It needs to secure its, uh, its supply chains so that its oil and, uh, and supplies don't get cut off if there's any hostility. Those of you that, uh, you know, that would know Second World War history, that was the catalyst that started Pearl Harbor when Japan couldn't get its oil supplies because of US blockades. Uh, so what it what it's doing now is it's spreading through, through there. It's got a base in Djibouti, which isn't marked on this map, on the Horn of Africa. Uh, it's their first uh, overseas military base. And then we take that and you get into the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is where it's spreading across on the sea and the thing in order to uh, build the airports and the ports and all that stuff that I talked about earlier but it, it's about now spreading Chinese influence, securing the Chinese uh, sort of compliant nations so that it feels more secure. Keep thinking back to the, to the century of humiliation and it hits Europe. Now, this is where you're beginning to get the pushback. In 2012, again, the year that Xi Jinping came to power, I don't know what we were all doing then, but a lot of stuff was happening. It signed a, an economic uh, arrangement with 16 uh, Eastern and Central European countries, most in the European Union, a few not, uh, with headquartered in Beijing. It was about business, loans, infrastructure building, and all the rest of it. It's now incidentally called the 17 plus one because Greece joined, I think, last year. What we've seen since that happened is a shift of some of the voting on issues about China on European Union statements. So there's been a couple on human rights and one on the South China Sea where Poland and Hungary and I think Greece uh, voted against what the European Union wanted to do, in other words, siding with China. So as you're seeing the political influence happening, the splitting of the values of the European Union through Chinese influence. And it's not just happening there. If you look at the wider world, we can see that the United Nations votes, these are recent votes here, on the Xinjiang camps that I just mentioned, which uh, in human rights terms is sort of horrifying uh, that, uh, that, sort of, uh, that, that uh, mindset there. Uh, a recent vote, 23 against China, led by the US, of course, and its allies, 50 governments voted for China, backing the policy of uh, incarcerating a million of its citizens on ethnic grounds. In Hong Kong, uh, the security law there, 27 voted against China, again, led by Britain and the US, 53 voted for China, backing the security law and what it was doing there. In other words, violating that international law treaty that it signed with Britain on the one country, 
two systems thing. <clears throat> and this is where it, it gets quite sort of difficult because then we go back to the concept of international law. It's being debated in the House of Commons today as to whether a democratically elected parliament should vote for a sovereign nation to break international law. Yet what we've been spreading around the world uh, is the rules-based international or rules-based order uh, based on international law. So you're getting, beginning to get these contradictions and people are beginning to uh, realize that as you can see in the voting. So last year there was a, uh, a court ruling uh, by the International Court of UN Court uh, against ruling against Britain's claim of sovereignty in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the reason that Britain sticks to that is because there's the base of Diego Garcia there, uh, an American base, and you can see how strategic that would be. Uh, in 2014, there was a, a, a ruling against China by a sister court saying that its uh, claim in the South China Sea was uh, illegal. <clears throat> different courts, different technicalities, but two courts uh, that uphold or, or, or rule on international law ruled against two, two different nations. Britain didn't engage with that. It said they weren't going to do anything about it. Um, but then that went to a UN uh, General Assembly vote, 116 against Britain and six, only six four. So this global power permanent member could only muster six votes, whereas the people that opposed it could muster 116. So from this, you can see, see that there is a shift of stuff going on. There's the, 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 uh, the, 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 the sort of contravention of international law, and there's a sense that liberal democracy doesn't necessarily deliver what it said it would deliver. There's a sense that maybe China's got a different way of doing things that could work for other other people. And when you get rid of international law and it gets weakened uh, to a degree, what you have left are the guns. The guns and the money essentially and that's the sort of area that I feel that we're going into now. Um, so this is the HMS um, uh, Elizabeth Carrier Group and the Carrier Group is going to deploy to the Indo-Pacific I think next year the year after if it's ready but with it will be <coughs> Dutch warships, French warships, American warships and when it goes through there they'll it'll do exercises with the Indians, the Malaysians, Singaporeans, uh, the Japanese. There's, there's a whole sort of cluster of alliances uh, there that um, are set particularly to balance China's rise. The French too are redeploying out there because they have um, uh, territory out there 1.5 million citizens living in territories in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so both France and Britain are redeploying to the Asia Pacific. Sitting in Beijing or in Humen, where the Opium War started, what do we think that looks like? The former colonial powers allied to Japan, which was another colonial power, now coming in to try to tell China what to do. That's the view coming in from Beijing. So when you look at the real politique of this, the military uh, things, the US runs the world order and is still much richer. And it also has got huge experience in building up alliances. So it's got 10 uh, signed off uh, military strategic alliances in the Indo-Pacific area. Uh, China has zero, uh, unless you want to count Pakistan, which I guess it could count on. Or North Korea, but essentially China can't take on these alliances which are strengthening by the day. You have the pushback from Europe, you have the deployment out there, so you've got China that tried to push forward perhaps too fast, is now being sort of forcibly uh, pushed back. And on top of that you've got the golden era which has become what I call the great freeze. Um, I've listed stuff down here, but it keeps changing so much because you have the trade war, the economic decoupling, the European Union claiming that China is a, um, or assessing China as a, a, as a systemic rival. Um, and then you have these alliances building up, led by India, 
the US, Australia and Japan, Britain and France joining and other country, countries sort of uh, massing around that. The world, issue of world orders is there's a list here of some of them which start in 1648 with the Treaty of Westphalia and we go down to the Treaty of Paris and Treaty of San Francisco that forged the those institutions that uh, that you saw at the beginning there. Now all of these came out of the rubble of war. The question now when we talk about the authoritarianism of China or the democracy of the West um, is are either side able to cede ground, compromise, do anything without there being more rubble of war? Is it possible to sit down and reform some of these institutions or is it going to be uh, dealt with uh, through the barrel of guns again? Now, there's a strategic um, uh, saying called a black swan. Uh, some people say it should be a grey whale, but uh, let's stick with a black swan because that's the picture that I've got up there at the moment. But a black swan is something that however much you think about it, how much you plan for it, uh, and, and the rest of it comes up and bites you in the backside, basically. 9-11 was a black swan. Uh, Pearl Harbor, according to some military historians, was a black swan. Uh, something, the financial crisis that could be uh, categorized uh, as a black swan. When I started this, thinking about did this, I, two years ago, I launched the first edition of Asian Waters at the National Liberal Club. I think I had three or four black swans in the Indo-Pacific area. Now, we're getting more of a talk, more talk going on now of a new Cold War. In Asia, the Cold War was very hot, as we know. We had Korea, we had Vietnam, we had other things there. Uh, these sort of, and these are all flashpoints. And if you, if we go back to what I said at the beginning, if any flashpoint actually suddenly flares up and the man on the street says, we've got to do something. And the politician goes on the, uh, the on the, the news, BBC news channel and says, we've got to do something. And that kicks up. You get policy being made on the hoof, uh, dictated by the crisis and the news channel. And we've seen a lot of this going on uh, at the moment. Um, what I, you know, what I dearly hope is that Britain certainly and Brit British like-minded allies with the same values examine what our record has been through the past 20 or 30 years and work out how to deal with the rise of this new power that has values that we don't quite understand and we don't quite accept. And just to go through these flashpoints, should any flare up, this is Kashmir. This is the India-China border that we've seen in the news in the past um, uh, month or so. The South China Sea, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, which I barely had time to talk about, but it's a real flashpoint. North Korea, another one, and then India, um, uh, uh, sorry, China and Japan. Uh, this is the scenario uh, of that. And with that, I will end uh, what I've got to say uh, hoping that we can sort it out, you know, as before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you very much, Humphrey. Thank you. I'm going to stop share now. So that, that's it. You're right. Okay. All right. Thank you very. Thank you. <laughs> David's muted, I think. His Lord Chichi is muted. In fact, every oh, mute. How's that? That's better. You know? How's that? I can hear you, David. Can anybody else? Excellent. Yes. Thank you, David. Thank you. We'll remember this period in our history by that magic expression. Can you hear me? <laughs> Am I muted? <laughs> That's a reminder. So, Humphrey, thank you very much for that presentation. It's quite fascinating. I'm just going to put a couple of points to you, as on the program, so to speak, which you may want to respond to, and then go on to question and answers. Um, and uh, Tim McNally will help me picking out the people uh, who, who wish to ask questions. 
And at the end, I want to uh, turn to my colleague, Gore Palmer, to give you a very, very well-deserved vote of thanks, plus, plus, of course, all those that participated now. So, Humphrey, that was a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I just want to try and, and add a little dimension to it, if I may, on, on the way that we might be moving forward, possibly away from armed conflict, and possibly for something even perhaps more sinister. Um, I noticed at the end of August that Edward Lucas, writing in the Times, noted that China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, carried out a damage limitation exercise to Europe. Uh, the intent apparently was to persuade the EU countries to steer clear of US-led efforts to punish China for cyber espionage, human rights abuses, um, um, and unfair trade practices. I think you alluded to this in your presentation. But the visit apparently did not go too well. Mr. Wang issued a warning to the Nobel Prize Committee in Oslo, in Norway, which had been rather friendly to China for the last nine years, about the consequences if they chose Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement for a reward. For an award. Uh, Joseph Borrell, the EU foreign policy chief, denounced Beijing as assertive, expansionist, authoritarian, and a new empire. Slight, somewhat positive shift, if you like, of the EU's position towards China. And even today, in the United Kingdom's broadsheet, there was a report that a Chinese tech firm is compiling a database on tens of thousands of British figures and their children and their families for use uh, by the country's intelligence agencies. And uh, my final point really is that only yesterday, the United Kingdom Chief of Defense Intelligence gave the first ever media briefing at his Cambridgeshire base of the changed character of warfare in ways that will challenge the West if they do not keep pace with adversaries who do not play by the rules. Such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, Novichok poisoning, just some examples of the way that the global players, such as Russia and China, continue to challenge the existing order without prompting direct conflict. So, Humphrey, my point to you really is, do, do you accept, uh, do you agree that uh, the confrontation is moving away from the traditional battlefield into more subtle, but probably more lethal ways of undermining um, our way. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, it is doing, uh, and, and, and that's the sort of race that's going on about cyberspace now and, and the technological uh, race. But I think the issue, David, is, 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 more, is that it's still confrontational. It's still mm. antagonistic. So you're, as, as long as this goes on, you've got the, the so-called liberal democracy side and the authoritarian side moving into more polarized positions when actually we need to bring them closer together. Um, Asia is an interesting concept because in Europe and North America, we basically have one political system and, and predominant religions and all that doing it. Mm -hmm. Asia is a complete mix. So if you're in a small Asian country, you might be a dictatorship having to work next to a democracy. Uh, you might be a Buddhist nation working next to a Muslim nation. Uh, we have 200 languages in Europe. They have 2,000 plus in Asia. So I, I think they have a different way of doing things because they know they can't push or, or put or, or, or one religion, one political system will not be able to predominate or to, 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 to dominate. And therefore they have to muddle through on that. And I think we're going to have to muddle through uh, with China in some way and find out how to work with this autocratic system, um, which in my view, incidentally, uh, 50, 100 years from now, will become a democracy because when you get an educated middle class, they have a pact with the government, and that pact is essentially accountability and elections and all that sort of thing. But it's not going to happen in five or ten years. Thank you very much, Humphrey. Now, I think we should move on to the Q&A. And here I need guidance from uh, Tim McNally, uh, who is going to tell me who wishes to speak first. I think it's the gentleman from the Chinese um, embassy. Lord Chiji, uh, I've sent you in the chat window a list of people, but the first person is Mr. Xiao Zheng, the councillor from the Chinese embassy, followed by the Right Honourable Sir Simon Hughes. Fine. Okay. Let's hear from the gentleman from the Chinese embassy. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, Mr. Xiao Zhen. Hi. Uh, hi. Good evening. Hi, good, good evening. Uh, this is Xiao from Chinese Embassy. Uh, I just want to make a, a brief response to the presentation. We believe that China is a peace-loving country and we have maintained good relations with our neighbors, especially around the South China Sea. We want to make it as a peace, uh, sea of peace, sea of cooperation, and sea of partnership. And we have no intention to go into war with the United States or other countries. So my message to the members of the parliament and others is that we should not be treated as a threat, but rather we should be treated as a partner. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed for a very concise response. Um, now on to the next uh, questioner, Sir, Sir Simon Hughes. Um, is sitting there on the screen looking at me and hopefully he's about to give us his thoughts and wisdom. <laughs> David <laughs> and uh, Humphrey and friends, uh, thank you very much. Um, can I put one sentence proposition, uh, Humphrey, and then ask for your uh, response. I first went to Africa in the early 80s and I learned then actually in Tanzania of how successful the Chinese were being in terms of economic engagement with developing countries which had been in empires like ours. What's your assessment over the last, the sweep of the last 40 years? Can I, before I pass this on to, to Humphrey, share, share your experience, Simon, because I too spent a lot of time in, in uh, many parts of Africa and also came across the uh, Chinese influence. I was working in Francophone Africa, and so I became familiar with the concept of the Palais de Peuple. This was the government buildings built by the Chinese for the people. But the issues that then arose were, were similar to those today in many respects because of the, un, um, the difficulties for the local uh, indigenous uh, uh, governmental order uh, to recognize exactly where the Chinese population who had come to the country to help build these projects were. And, uh, and it was very difficult for them to actually regain uh, total control uh, of their societies and, and their local economies. Anyway, over to Humphrey. I, you dropped out, Simon, right at the end of that. We, you were saying the... the my, my, I'm really seeking your assessment of, of, of over the last 40 years, where the China has been more successful than, than uh, the States, than Europe, France, or the UK, or Russia, in expanding its economic interests around the world, and that and the, the rest of us have been playing catch-up. Or is it that China, as it were, has come from nowhere, relatively, in terms of that sort of economic influence and that's why we've noticed it and perhaps have been more troubled about it in the last 40 years whereas the states the uk france have been players for such a long time yes i, I think i'll answer that with a couple of anecdotes if if, if that's okay the first story i did for the bbc on the chinese in africa was in tanzania uh, and it was quite incredible for myself in that we went in there and usually when you go into a, a, a country like that you interview the American or the British ambassador. This time we set up a very similar interview with the Chinese ambassador because that was where the power was. And I was going to interview a European um, uh, uh, engineer there that was, was building something and he pulled out at the last minute and said, look, I can't risk my business because, uh, because the Chinese have somebody in every ministry and I've got to be careful of what I'm doing. But the thing that we filmed there was a, a heart hospital uh, in, in the capital uh, that was being built by the Shenyang Heart Hospital Building Corporation or something. And the engineers were living in porter cabins and they were working 24 seven. They built the hospital in about a, you know, a year or six months and then they would train up the nurses and then they would leave. When I interviewed the finance minister there, he said, if we had the Europeans to do that, each of those engineers would have wanted a four bedroom house, school fees, swimming pool, flights home and the rest of it. So it might not be quite as good as we would get in European standards, but this is Africa. So we would prefer to take that. And whenever I've been flying around Africa and, and going back to places uh, that, that I've been to before, like in West Africa, the Ivory Coast and that, you would arrive to a dreadful airport full of, you know, 
people pushing and screaming and, and, and all of that sort of thing. And then a year later, you'd go in and there'd be an airport built by the, uh, built by the Chinese. Now, if you're in an African village and you need like a bridge across a river to get your children to school or hospital, and you've got, and you're looking at a dozen signs from Oxfam, Save the Children, DFID and all the rest of it, and no bridge has been built because you haven't ticked the gender equality thing properly on the form. And this is as it was told to me by somebody uh, in uh, Uganda. And then the Chinese come in and build that bridge. You're going to go with the person that builds the bridge as opposed to the person that tells you that you need gender equality and democracy. And I think that is what has been sweeping through Africa uh, for the past 20 years. Thank you, Humphrey. Now, I did have uh, on my group chat list here uh, Janet Berridge, but she seems to have disappeared. She's in Berlin, but I'm not quite sure where. Janet, if you're there, please come and ask a question. By all means. Yes, there she is. There she is. Bless her. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, good evening, everybody. Humphrey, that was very enlightening and very interesting. Um, what I uh, was interested in uh, particularly today, uh, some members of the uh, European Union had a conference call with, I understand, um, uh, Mr. Xi in um, Beijing, and they were making it clear that they were not happy with um, uh, the policies of China, um, the, um, in this, especially the things that you mentioned earlier. And they were, there was talk this morning on the radio about the possibility of imposing sanctions or something like that to show that the European community was um, serious about this and that they, they uh, didn't want to um, accept um, the sort of behavior. Um, it's always about human rights, about Hong Kong and the, uh, the Muslims in the camps and everything. And, um, but it was pointed out that they wouldn't really achieve anything or, or very little. And then there was the discussion about whether sanctions should be on individuals or on Chinese government projects or, or whatever. Do you think that sanctions would even have any um, effect on Chinese policy uh, as it stands now? I, I, I think it, it would, but I, I don't think it's the right path to go down. Uh, I think that the Chinese, given, given what they've achieved uh, since, say, Tiananmen Square, you have some of the most intelligent people in the world sitting in Beijing and they know exactly what is happening. They don't want to lose Europe. Uh, China can't rule the world if it loses Europe. And certainly it can't rule the world if it loses India, if it loses Japan, if it, if it doesn't have a good relationship. And what's happened in the past year or so is that Europe's woken up finally to the fact that you have to draw some lines. And I think all Europe has to do is draw some guidelines says, okay, you can buy our pizza parlors, but you can't steal our technology and you're not, not going to go into our critical infrastructure. Uh, and so everybody knows that. And if, if we catch you trying to influence Hungary and Poland into voting against us, which would probably happen if these sanctions were, 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 were going about, then, then you're in trouble too. And how much do we want, and then we have to think, how much do we want Chinese money into our universities uh, and our schools? Uh, and, 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 and that kind of thing. And what we haven't done, certainly in Britain, and the European Union has done, is actually said, right, we've got a rising power here, as we've had with Germany a hundred years ago or so, and, and we've had this. How are we going to deal with it? And you draw your big red lines, and I think a big red line is how can we, how much business can we do with a country that incarcerates a million of its own citizens under ethnic grounds? But if we don't do that business, what are we going to lose? Uh, yes, you can invest in this, but you can't invest in that. Those, you could do it on a sheet of A4 paper, but it hasn't been done. And nor, incidentally, as I said earlier, have we actually had a scrutiny and assessment of where we fail people. Because when we say we want elections, we want China to become democratic, which is what would come on the streets, that would be a catastrophe for the next 20 or 30 years, it would be, a and if we think what we tried to do in Iraq and Libya and transpose that onto China, you have got a nightmare scenario happening and we haven't even yet acknowledged it 
uh, in, in our own debates. Thank you, Humphrey. Uh, next is um, Don Hooter, Tuta, sorry, Don Dutter, du 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 and that will be followed by uh, Linda Chung. So, first of all, Don. Hello there. Uh, that was a very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, uh, to bring an authoritarian re regime like China to the table, should you not, sh should, do you not agree that that can only happen if you sh come from a position of strength? And I say that, uh, two examples, like in the South China Sea, uh, quoting from your book, Asian Waters, the fisherman, Jendry Gosson, had to run for his life as a fisherman because of attacked by the Chinese uh, Navy. Today, China has to face four uh, navies of Australia, Japan, India, and USA. And then going to the other extreme in the Himalayan Heights, um, India now controls all the strategic high points south and north of Pangong Lake. So where, was the, where the China plan was to somehow uh, get into Ladakh and, and capture it, uh, has been thwarted and the result of that is the Chinese foreign minister has had a meeting with the Indian foreign minister and they've now agreed a five-point plan for de-escalation. My point being that we were talking from a position of strength in that case. So, so that I'm saying to bring a, a, a regime, a authoritarian regime to the table, um, I think we need to open the dialogue from a position of strength would you agree or would you comment on that? Thank you very much, Humphrey. And yes, yes, I completely agree. You need to keep the position of strength and the United States has been exceptionally skillful in the past two or three years in building up these exact alliances that, that you alluded to in the South China Sea and the Philippines and that sort of thing. And of course, bringing India on side. Uh, so, it, it, you know, there was a similar sort of alliance that in the 62 war, uh, with, with, um, uh, with between China and India caused China to backpedal very quickly because they thought that the US might use a nuclear weapon against them. So yes, these alliances are very, very important, but I think what's in, what is equally important here is that China doesn't feel that its decisions are being made uh, under stress uh, through humiliation. And that's a very nuanced cultural thing that has to be understood. If you can, we can bring it round without that. And, and we tasted that with Russia. And Russia felt humiliated and trashed and exploited after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union. We don't want a similar situation to happen with China. And I do think that there could be some sort of conference or negotiations to reform the world order to take into account the rise of Asia. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Humphrey, that's fine. Uh, now, Linda Chang, who was a co-founder of the Chinese Liberal Democrats and a past Lib Dem councillor. Linda. Linda? Right. Ah, Sorry, Humphrey, no. I, I was muted. Humphrey, that was an absolutely fascinating talk uh, and thank you. Thank you. Very thank distinguished you. company. Thank you, Peter, thank you. I, I, I'm in very distinguished company with all these internationalists, but I wanted to make a couple of points. First of all, China never started any wars, and I feel that a lot of the enmity now uh, has been stirred up by Trump. You talked about us all muddling through. I can see that the Prime Minister is very much muddling through. So, uh, you know, the fact that uh, uh, there's lots to put right yet, that is understood. Uh, when, when we, right at the beginning, your slide said uh, liberal, a lib, liberal Democrat world order, and then you went on to an American world order uh, or the US world order. And I think we, we as liberal Democrats need to be very distinct what we're trying to convey to the world and to China. Um, now, what, 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 my question, if I may, I'm very, very sorry that you had a slide which put uh, Xi Jinping next door to some uh, recognised monsters. Um, and what I'm afraid of is this fear of China is perpetuating 
hate towards the Chinese community here and racism, particularly with this current COVID crisis and with Trump saying it's, it's the Chinese virus. How are we going to, as Liberal Democrats, stop that happening? Thank you very much, Linda. Humphrey. Um, I can't be prescriptive, but I completely share your concern. And that's why, precisely why I did that. Um, you've, got the China, you, you've got this idea that the US does often is that they separate off the government from the people. Uh, but uh, I think, as, as, as we know, that the patriotism in China is very high. Uh, Hong Kong itself is as divided as we are on Brexit, they are on, on the Chinese security law. These things aren't understood here. Um, so I think the, the, you know, the only way to do it is to, when somebody comes up to you and says, what are we going to do about Xi Jinping, that monster, just explain a little bit. Uh, word of mouth is always the best, best way to do it. At the moment, there is a, a sort of, and it'll go on until the US election, definitely, of, of making China enemy number one. And when you go into that area, there is a huge amount of ground uh, that is very dangerous and open to misunderstanding. Thank you very much, Humphrey. I've got a, a signal coming up telling me that we've run out of time. Is that right, Tim? Yes, clearly. Right, we, so I'm um, sorry to those of you. Of time, but... <laughs> we've run out of time, is that right? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we probably need to call on Lord Palmer. Well, I don't think you need to put it back quite that way. It's always a pleasure to hear Lord Palmer. <laughs> well, that, <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Would you like to give us your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is Lord Monroe Palmer, um, a member of the National Legal Cup for over 50 years and currently one of the deputy speakers um, of the House of Lords in the UK. Um, it is my great pleasure to thank Humphrey Hawksley um, for his terrific talk. I think we all okay. agree on that. And, and if any of you can read the book, it really is, he's only touched on things which are dealt in much greater detail in the book. And what better place to have a talk on challenge to liberal democracy than at the National Liberal Club? <laughs> and my thanks also to Mr. Xiao Zeng from the Chinese Embassy by gracing us with his presence, to Simon Hughes um, for his normal words of wisdom, to Janet Berridge, Don Dutter, Linda Chung. I don't think I've missed anyone out, but there's obviously other people who would like to have spoken. It is also my great pleasure to thank the guru behind all this, and that's Trevor Peel, because without any of this, um, it wouldn't happen. To thank Lord Shiji, David, for chairing the meeting with his normal expertise and his knowledge of the world. Uh, to thank Tom McNally for making it work, I think reasonably well, more than reasonably well, technically. Um, the points I would just try and make very, very quickly is that when you read the book, um, which deals in great, much greater detail with what Humphrey's managed to say to us in 30 minutes, you realise that all these islands in the South China Sea, including pieces like, places like Mischief Reef and so on, um, is, is unbelievable. And you realise that these, these um, fortifications which are taking place, these, these takeovers, of islands um, is um, a recipe for something I'm not sure what. And when Humphrey said in, in a passing remark that this is more serious than the Middle East, you realize how serious it is. Um, the, we mentioned in passing and had little time for the Uyghur, Mo the Uyghur Muslims, the Xinjiang camps and Hong Kong. Taiwan, hardly got to mention, and here in the National Liberal Club, we, we do welcome the people from Taiwan very often talk to us here as well. So it is my great pleasure to thank Humphrey for his terrific talk, to recommend his book and other books, and to thank again uh, the Lord Chiji for chairing this meeting. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, my final comment, if I may, Chairman's uh, prerogative. I remember my first experience of the South China Sea was sending postcard from uh, Brunei to my wife which said on it, my message was, I'm sipping chilled shabbily in front of the South China Sea. And that was my final thought on it. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a wonderful evening. Thank you, Humphrey, for Thank your... You. your